we are in this year of a plague of plagues. And every year in this time, in the winter, in January, we read about the plagues. We learn about the plagues that happened, the 10 plagues. And that is what is happening in this Torah portion. And it's also always striking to me that it's right around this time on Martin Luther King Day celebrated that we read about the beginning of the journey for freedom the leaving of Egypt of the narrow place and the journey of Exodus. And it always corresponds around this time to Martin Luther King Day, fitting tribute to freedom. So in this Torah portion, we are in the book of Exodus, Shemot. We just began it last week. Last week we learned that Moses came to the burning bush and he heard the presence of the divine telling him that he needed to go back to Egypt, to Mitzrayim, the narrow place, and to lead a movement for freedom and liberation, to go to Pharaoh and to say, let my people go. Moses in the interaction listened and said, actually, no, <laughs> that's not me. I'm not going to do that. You need somebody else. God says, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. It's you. It's you, Moses. I'm talking to you. And truly, it does seem, if you think about it, who else would be so well suited for this? Moses, you're a child raised in two worlds, the home of your people and the adopted home of Pharaoh's daughter and the rest of the household. You have access you speak the language, you know what to do and how things work. You are absolutely the right person. But no, Moses is insisting, no, it's not me. They won't listen to me. Yes, God says again, yes, it's you. Moses says, actually, the, the real deal is, and I know this is going to like stop you from saying it's me. It, I have a speech impediment. So clearly, it's not me. Moses says to God, I have a speech impediment, so really it's not me. God says again, Moses, it is you. And finally, after being told, you do not have to do it alone, your brother Aaron will go with you, Moses agrees. And indeed, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. But it's not working. He's just started trying in this Torah portion. And we learned just at the end of the last one that when he went the first time and asked, let my people go, not only did the Pharaoh not agree, but he began to make it harder on the Israelites. He said, well, before we gave you straw to make the bricks, now you find your own straw and we want as many bricks. So not only has Moses not made things better, he's made things worse where we find him in this part of our tale. Pharaoh has a reactionary response. And the people, the Israelite people, see Moses and Aaron as they're being forced to work harder. And they say to them, what are you doing to us, Moses? May God punish you for this. Moses goes back to God and says, really? I told you I cannot do this. The Israelites will not listen to me. Pharaoh will list, not listen to me. It's my speech impediment. Here in this Torah portion, Moses brings it up again. It's my speech impediment. That's why this isn't working. That's my problem. It's the speech impediment. Back to that he goes. That's what it is, he says. Of the many, many reasons why Pharaoh is not letting them go such as they are a source of labor, they are his property and possession. He doesn't want to lose power. He doesn't want to look weak. It could go very badly. Others could get a similar idea. There are many, many reasons why Pharaoh would not want this to happen. The top reason is not Moses' speech impediment. Yet this is what Moses immediately thinks and assumes and ascribes is the problem. Ah, this is the story he is telling himself immediately, reflexively, habitually. Moses says to himself habitually, this would only go better if I was smooth in speech. That's it, that must be the issue. 
We all have a story we tell ourselves about ourselves. For Moses, it was about his speech, learned very young and attributed to all things. Sometimes these stories are true, and sometimes, oftentimes, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what we can and cannot do are not true. But they take hold and they have such great power in us that the moment something goes awry, we go, oh, I know what it is. It's that same thing. It's always me. It happens all the time. Well, it might not be. That might just be the story we've told ourselves. Dr. Susan David and her book, Emotional Agility, talks about the idea of getting hooked, hooked into these stories. Like the hook of a song that we can't get out of our head. It goes round and round and round. She says the human mind is a meaning-making machine and a big part of a human being is laboring to make sense of all the input around us. We try to make sense of it into a coherent narrative and it serves a purpose. We tell ourselves these stories to organize our experiences. The problem is, the trouble is, the problem is, the trouble is, we often get these stories wrong. We accept these pervasive self accounts without question as if it's the whole truth. I love this line, she says, we crawl inside of these fables. We crawl inside of these fables and we let a sentence or a paragraph which may have originated long, long ago when we were little children or a little bit older children, many years ago that have never been tested and verified and we present them as the totality of our lives. We all have these stories and they are so powerful. I wonder if right now in these COVID times when there's less distraction and here we are with ourselves, here we are with ourselves every day. I wonder if these stories are coming out a little louder. Maybe this could be helpful about this time. Come on, stories, tell me who you are. Come on, stories, come a little louder. Bring them out into the light. Maybe bring them out into the light. Repeat them, name them, and then verify them with somebody around us. Hey, this thing happened. I think it's because of this. How does that sound to you? They may say, oh yeah, that's exactly why it happened. <laughs> they may say, well, I don't, I don't know. Let's think this through. Let's think of lots of different reasons. Instead of the one that we're stuck on, the ones that are reflexive, that pop up so quickly. Part of what we need to do is slow down and hear the stories. The stories that say, I'm not going to get my needs met, so why try? I'm not any good at this, so I'll mess it up. I'm not any good at this, so I'll mess it up. The automatic responses get us hooked. They get us hooked. Now, what Dr. David comes back to saying is that we need to figure out what these stories are so we can say, are they just an established pa pattern or are they really what we want our lives to be based on? Are we managing our lives according to our own values and what's most important to us? As we talk about over and over again in this community about the midot, the deepest Jewish values, we want them in there, but sometimes they can't get in there to guide our lives because there's these stories that we have grabbed onto. If we want our values to be at the core of our lives, we need to bring out the stories and see what they are and let them speak into the world and get them checked out by others who we know and who trust and care and, and, and want to help us. Into our lives, we bring these stories so that we can make room for the stories that allow us to be aligned with who we are and who we want to be we are and what we want to be in the world and we bring these stories out how how do we even get an indication that they're there because we have emotions thank god for our beautiful blessed emotions because they signal to us that something is awry and that our values are not being at the core of who we are and what we want 
What are those personal stories for you? What are they for you? What are they for you that you're telling yourself over and over again about why things are or are not happening, about who you are, about who you can be, about what you are supposed to and not supposed to do and be? What are the stories? How do we bring them out? And how do we put in new narratives? Narratives that lead us to our values. What are the new stories that we want to write? Everything is based on story, friends. We have personal stories and we have collective stories. Stories are the foundation for culture and for peoplehood. Many of our collective stories as a people are aspirational. The story in this Torah portion of Exodus, of freedom, it is one of our major stories as a Jewish people. And it has been so aspirational and transformational and a, such a guide to us as a people. Stories can actually not play just a diminishing role. Stories can play an expansive role putting the values of who we want to be right in front of us. As a Jewish people, we tell every year, this time in January, and then again at Passover, about this journey of leaving the narrow place, about freedom and liberation, about how we were oppressed, so we have this empathy, so we have this solidarity, so we have this connection with other people who are oppressed. This is who we are. And unfortunately, there's been other times in our history as a people where this has been repeated, where we have been oppressed again. And again, from that, we draw forward who we want to be and how we want to stand with others. It's a profound story, the story of Exodus. It is value aligned with who we want to be. It brings us into an ongoing commitment of who we want to be as a people. And there are so many times when as a people, we have really lived up to this. And there are times where we haven't, especially more recently in the United States, where we have stopped in the same way speaking up for others who are more vulnerable because we have not been as connected to that experience. Not all of us, but many of us. What is it like to connect to these stories and to ask what do the stories demand of us? the ones that are expansive, the ones that are leading us towards our values. The United States has a story too, a story about who we are, an aspirational story, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A pledge that many of us said as kids every day with liberty and justice for all. Such a powerful, such an important story but not the whole story because there's been many people who haven't had access to that liberty and justice for all. And yet it's such a profound story to lead us where we want to go. Rabbi Prinz spoke at the March on Washington in 1963, and he brought the aspirational story as a Jewish person and as an American together. He says, as Americans, we share the profound concern of millions of people about the shame and disgrace of inequality and injustice, which make a mockery of the great American idea. As Jews, we bring to this great demonstration in which thousands of us proudly participate, a twofold experience, one of the spirit and one of our history. Our ancient history began with slavery, Rabbi Prince said, to all of those people on the March on Washington and the yearning for freedom. During the Middle Ages, my people lived for a thousand years in the ghettos of Europe. Our modern history begins with a proclamation of emancipation. It is for these reasons that it's not merely sympathy and compassion for the Black people of America that motivates us. It is above all and beyond all such sympathies and emotions, a sense of complete identification and solidarity born of our painful historic experience. When I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing that I learned under those tragic circumstances with that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem, the most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful and the most tragic problem is silence. 
friends, we've had a lot of silence in our Jewish community. And it's time for us to think about how to stand out more fully. He ends it by talking about the Pledge of Allegiance. And he said, I believe the time has come to work together for it is not enough to hope together and it is not enough to pray together, to work together. We must work together for this children's oath pronounced every morning from Maine to California, from north to south, and may it become a glorious, unshakable reality in a morally renewed and united America. Words of Rabbi Prinz on the March on Washington. Here we are now in this collective time, this time of heightened focus on who we are in the United States to talk about these stories and are they true and how to make these aspirational stories true. Nicole Hannah Jones wrote a beautiful series, or spot, was sponsored a beautiful series of articles and wrote one herself called the 1619 Project in August. And I want to point you to finding it. She writes about her own connection to the American flag. She said, my dad always flew an American flag in our front yard. The blue paint on our two-story house was perennially chipping. The fence or the rail by the stairs or the front door existed in a perpetual state of despair. But that flag always flew pristine. Our corner lot, which had been redlined by the federal government, was along the river that divided the black side from the white side of our Iowa town. At the edge of our lawn, high on an aluminum pole, soared the flag, which my dad would replace as soon as it saw the slightest tatter. She goes on to say that her dad was born into a family of sharecroppers on a white plantation in Greenwood, Mississippi, where black people bent over cotton from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, just as their enslaved ancestors had done not long before. The Mississippi of, of she said of her dad's youth was an apartheid state that subjected its near majority black population through breathtaking acts of violence. White residents in Mississippi lynched more black people than those in any other state in the country. And in her dad's county, it lynched more black residents than those in any other county in Mississippi. And she goes on to talk about her mother who could not vote or use the public library or find work other than toiling in the cotton fields. So she packed up her belongings and moved in the great migration to the North and came to Illinois. And she talks about her grandmama finding a house in a segregated black neighborhood on the city's east side and found the work that was considered black women's work where no no matter where black women lived, cleaning white people's houses and how her dad struggled joining the army and coming back. The United States, she says, is a nation founded on both an ideal and a lie, a story and a lie. Declaration of Independence saying all men are created equal endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, but the white man who drafted those words did not believe them to be true for the hundreds of thousands of black people in their midst. And in closing, I wanna share this that she said, when I was a child, I must have been in fifth or sixth grade and a teacher gave our class an assignment intended to celebrate the diversity of the great American melting pot. She instructed each of us to write a short report on our ancestral land and then to draw the nation's flag of our ancestors. As she turned to write the assignment on the blackboard, the other black girl in the class locked eyes with me. Slavery had erased any connection we had to an African country. And even if we tried to claim the whole continent, there was no African flag. It was hard enough being one of two black kids in the class and this assignment would just be another reminder of the distance between the white kids and us. 
In the end, I walked over to the globe, she said. I picked a random African country and claimed it as my own. She says, I wish now that I could go back to the younger me and tell her that her people's ancestry started here on these lands and to boldly, proudly draw the stars and the stripes of the American flag. We were told once by virtue of our bondage that we could never be American, but it was by virtue of our bondage that we became the most American of all. The stories we tell are powerful, friends. They are powerful stories that organize who we are as a people, who we are as part of the United States, who we are on our inside. We must honestly look at these stories of who we are and draw them forward into the light and make sure that they are aligned with our values our values of how we want to treat ourselves and others and our own people and all the many peoples of this land. Are we honestly living the aspirational narratives of our people? Are we honestly living the aspirational narrative of the United States? On Wednesday, a new president will be inaugurated but the story of who we are will not be held by one person. We all need to hold the story and actively engage in making sure that the ideals are what we want them to be and to continue to transform to represent the possibility that is held in the story. May you draw out the stories that shape your own life. May you bring them into the light of day of close ones and community to see if these are the stories that align with who you are and who you wanna be. May we draw out the stories of our people. May we draw out the stories of the United States. May we tell the whole story and may we create a country that is indeed the aspirations we have told ourselves that we can be. We can be, we can be. Shabbat Shalom. יישר כוח, יישר כוחך. Dressed up inside a room behind the screen With your makeup on Cause you don't belong Inside the circles and the packs that they are forming Empty 
page on New Year's Day. The writing's on the wall if you're still listening. Ooh, your story waits for you. you